Today, by popular demand, we're going to be talking about the legendary traditional Japanese tattooer, Oriyoshi II. We're going to be covering the man, what made him legendary. We're going to be talking about some of the characteristics of his style, and we're going to be walking through five of his works. So, that being said, without any further ado, let's do it. Oriyoshi II, also known by his real name of Kuronuma, was born in 1914 to Horiyoshi I. Oriyoshi I being a legendary traditional Japanese tattooer himself. He was based in the Asabu region of Tokyo and he became an extremely influential figure in the world of traditional Japanese tattooing. He was a skilled painter since childhood. In fact, his father, Horiyoshi I, was hoping for him to be a famous painter, but of course, Horiyoshi II, Mr. Kuronuma, had other plans and he wanted to continue the family legacy, continue the family lineage, and carry on with the Horiyoshi name. There are many things that differentiate in Horiyoshi II, but today I really want to focus on three main areas. Now, one of those areas is in the background. Horiyoshi II's backgrounds were different from the norm and would come to impact and influence many more Horiyoshi Takano. He used thinner lines in the backgrounds, meaning there were more skin breaks. You could see more of the skin in the backgrounds. That by itself was a differentiator. And that differentiator allowed for more dynamism to be shown in the backgrounds because he could use those thinner lines. He could use those bigger skin breaks to show movement, both in the backgrounds themselves, but also with the elements and, and the figures employed throughout the tattoo. Oriyoshi II brought amazing dynamism to traditional Japanese tattoos. You could see the movement in the wind, in the waves, in the clouds, the elements within the tattoo, and of course, the characters and the figures, the elements themselves had movement. This dynamism in the backgrounds and the figures, the thinner lines with the bigger skin breaks would be some of the hallmarks of his style, but they would also be adopted by many Horishi both in his lifetime and of course ever since. In fact, many Horishi nowadays were masters of a style that was initially adopted from some of the elements that Horiyoshi II uh, incorporated into traditional Japanese tattooing. Another differentiator in Horiyoshi II's style, which was very rare back then and it's actually very rare still now, is architecture. He would use architecture in his tattooing compositions. You would see stuff like branches of, of trees. You would see roofs. You would see stones. You would see bells. You would see just objects in there and architecture to really provide not just more flavor to the tattoos, but that actually aided in providing three-dimensionality to the tattoos. In fact, that three-dimensionality could be another differentiator by itself where the technique and the sophistication of these 3D elements wasn't so advanced so as to seem like realism, but they were sophisticated enough that you could tell, oh, that looks like it's a 3D figure. So it just hit that sweet spot, that just right sweet spot that made it, that still made it to be a traditional Japanese tattoo, but provided that dynamism and that 3D element to it. Now, as I mentioned before, Horiyoshi II was a great inspiration to many Horishi of the past and many Horishi of today, both masters and people still on the up and up. Some names that come to mind are Horiyoshi III, who obviously now has a very distinctive personal style, but he was obviously influenced by Horiyoshi II. Others include Horitoshi I, Horitoku I, and of course, many, many others. But that just goes to show the impact that Oriyoshi II had on masters of today, but then also in general. You can see what I'm saying just by focusing on the backgrounds that many of today's tattooers employ. Now, two additional things that I want to call out, and I wouldn't call them differentiators because, of course, many Horishi do this as well, but there's still traits of Oriyoshi II's style, and those things are that he wouldn't overcrowd the tattoo compositions, right? It wouldn't be just one thing, but it wouldn't be a hundred things either. So he had that great balance to make sure that he didn't overcrowd 
the tattoos. And that gave it a very strong feeling, a very strong element. It brought a very strong element to his compositions. Another thing is actually the use of colors. You know, in my other video talking about the Taisho versus the Showa era, you learn how the use of colors came to be and evolved throughout the course of traditional Japanese tattooing history. And of course, Oriyoshi II was a very strong force in that adoption and, and use of many colors. Now, having gained that base high-level understanding of Oriyoshi II, the man, his style, let's actually look at his works. Let's walk through five of legendary Oriyoshi II's works. So the figure we have here is Washio Saburo. Washio Saburo was a hunter who was part of Minamoto no Yoshitsune's retinue, a legendary samurai, and he would guide him through the mountains in his quest for conquest. This piece is a great example of some of the elements that I mentioned earlier. You can see the dynamism and the movement in the background, in the clouds, in the leaves. You can see the movement in Saburo's hair, in the bird. You can see the employment of various colors. You can also see that it's not overcrowded. It, there's a very big focus on the subject matter, that being, of course, Saburo. There's a certain three-dimensionality that's brought by that contrast between the background and, of course, the foreground. And this is, of course, brought by, by the fact that there are thinner lines in the background. There are more skin breaks. And like I mentioned earlier, those skin breaks allow for that perception of movement. Now, moving along here, we're looking at Yaega Kihime. And in this composition, you can basically see the princess here holding a helmet, which belonged to her thought to be deceased husband, who turns out to actually be alive and he was in disguise. And so this composition here, you can see her holding up the helmet, returning it. And again, there's various of those elements mentioned earlier at play. You can see the architecture here. You can see that lantern. You can see this sort of bridge in there. You can see Horiyoshi II's artistic sensibilities, as you can see the momiji at the top there, which really accentuate the whole composition. There's also many colors being employed and many details in the robes here of Yaega Kihime. Now, rather than that dynamism that we saw earlier in the Washio Saburo composition, what's really in focus here are those architectural elements. And this is a great example of how you can use several elements, not too many, to a great effect in providing that story to the composition. Moving along, what we have here is a carp swimming upstream. And this actually goes along with the story or, or the belief that the carp who swims up a legendary waterfall becomes a dragon. And I really like this piece because this carp is huge, and yet there's, again, that dynamism that I've been talking about so much. You can see the water in there. You can see the movement in the leaves. You can see the movement in, in the carp itself just swimming upstream. This composition is a great example of how that simplicity or, or that relative minimalism in the amount of elements employed can bring a lot of power to the composition. Here in this next picture, you have many elements that you actually don't see that much today in traditional Japanese tattooing. You can see the horizon there, the mountains. This, of course, what we're looking at is Ushiwakamaru or the young Minamoto no Yoshitsune training with the Tengu as per the legendary tale of the historical character. And there's many things happening in here. There's many elements, yet somehow the composition feels balanced. You see several Karasu Tengo there at the bottom sort of training with Ushiwakamaru, and then you see the, the Tai Tengu, I would assume that's Sojo Bo there in the background behind Ushiwakamaru, and then behind them, you can see the, again, the trees, the mountains, and, and the horizon. And this composition is a great example of many of the elements that came to represent Oriyoshi II, and that for some reason, you actually don't see that much of today. Going even further, you can see that the 
Karasu Tengu or the Kotengu there at the bottom are standing on rocks. And then you can see clouds behind Ushiwakamaru. And again, I keep repeating and talking about the the mountains and the horizon because it's just it's just so different. And it really just pops out and makes it really special. This is a great composition showcasing May of Oryoshi II's signature elements. And it's also a great representation of the story of Ushiwakamaru training with the Tengu. Lastly, what we have here is Hakata Kojoro. And Kojoro is a harlot or a prostitute from Hakata, the southern region of, of Japan. And she was a central figure in a kabuki play. Now, this composition is very cool because you can see that amazing spider web there in the background. It really pops out. It's really a feast for the eyes. And you can also see three-dimensionality there with the leaves. Some of the leaves are in the foreground, some of the leaves are in the background, or in the background of the background, if that makes sense. And then, of course, you have Kojoro there and the foreground with some beautiful robes with chrysanthemum and peonies, and it just looks fantastic. Many colors at play, three-dimensionality, not that many overwhelming elements. It's a great example of relative simplicity and a great example of Horiyoshi II's style. Now to recap, we talked about how Horiyoshi II became such a legendary and impactful Horishi. We talked about some of the differentiators of its style, the thinner lines, the dynamism in the background, in the figures, the employment of architectural elements in its compositions, the three-dimensionality that came from all those elements being together, the elements or the compositions not being overcrowded, right? The power of relative simplicity and the use of colors. All those elements came together to make, of course, incredible compositions. And as I mentioned, Oriyoshi II has been a very influential figure in the world of traditional Japanese tattooing, both at the specific Horishi level, but then of course, in general, across the backgrounds and elements being used in traditional Japanese tattooing today. Now, this was a very brief and high-level introduction into the world of Horiyoshi II and Mr. Kuronuma, but if you'd like to see coverage of other Horishi or other elements or areas of traditional Japanese tattooing, just drop me a line, drop me a message, and I'll be happy to cover it. Thank you very much for watching.